I think it's going to go well. Hopefully I survive it. Oh, man. But God bless my wife. I have ginger chicken soup in my coffee mug. Isn't she awesome? That's great. I'm going to tell you about um, a beef we had about this soup in my message. And, of course, I had to ask for forgiveness in my message. So, anyway, come on up, you guys. Everybody, come on in. It is. Secret Asian recipe. Thank you, Wayne. So um, if you need notes, go ahead and raise your hand. Our guys will get them to you. Um, and actually, um, we have Bibles in the back. If you forgot yours, you, need, you can either grab one. There's only one text we're going to use today, but everything will be on the screen um, this morning. And so um, how do you like my shirt? Happy birthday, America. Yeah. Isn't that great? 241 years old, our nation is. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love it. I love it. As you're getting ready, my, my earliest memories of July 4th were, are interesting. My father was a, a, a Marine and um, served in Korea and twice in Vietnam. And so my earliest memories, I don't know where my mom is, but mom, we got to grab a picture. Michelle has them. My dad would every year, because um, I didn't see him for three um, Fourth of Julys in a row, but he would find a way every July 4th to stick two flags in a foxhole in the midst of his M1 and everything, and, and he would take pictures in the battlefield with his, you know, with his thing there. And I look back and I go, brave man. But it was his tradition, but my father is the one that really influenced me to fall in love with our country. You know, dads do that. And so anyway, so I, I'm just someone, so I'm, 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 an, I'm unapologetic about my love for America fly my flag, got my special Aloha flag shirt, and um, check with me after, and I'll tell you where you can get it online. But um, I want you to open your Bibles if, if you want to look. There's only one verse that we're going to focus on. There's a lot of supporting verses, but it's, it's an important enough verse, um, and Scott and I know this because we did a men's retreat at One Love on this, but it's 2 Timothy 1.7, okay? And this is the verse that is all about our freedom, right? And Because... And and so what we're going to be doing is this and over the next six weeks, I'm going to, seven weeks, I'm going to be doing a biblical look at the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And here's my goal for us. The Bible says that um, when we're all born, we all sin and fall short of God's glory. So we become dependent on sin. We're driven by the passions and, and appetites of our flesh. So we're dependent. So what Christ does is that in salvation, he sets us free and we become independent. So we're dependent on sin. We, we become independent from sin. But now what we've got to learn is how to be dependent on God, right? So this study is going to take us from how to be, being dependent to independent. But then here's the key thing and why it's important to come to church. Because it's not just that we're, we're, we're breaking away from sin and we're connected to God, but the way God designed the body of Christ is that we're all connected to one another. So there's a third part of growing in the Lord, right? We're dependent. We break the bonds of sin. We're independent. We're connected to God. But the goal is how do we become the body of Christ? We become interdependent, right? We depend on one another. I got your back right? And I got your back is more than just a cool saying. It's I got your back. One of the neat things is um, we're remodeling our house, which makes me husband of the year. Thank you. And, um, and I've got Larry and, and his incredible artisans just, they're installing windows for me. And so Larry set everything up, but because he's got a lot of people's back, he, um, he texts me on Friday night, and, and he says that he's going to help a friend with his floor. Now, because I'm on Facebook, I know who the friend is. <laughs> and I know the big guy's going to be there and a whole bunch of people are going to help. So I had a little moo-moo party because I thought everybody's going over there and no one's going to be at my house. And I'm paying. And so, um, <laughs> but Larry has my back. And he sends his cousin, Keola, who's an artisan, who is as meticulous as my friend. I go down there, and he's got his laser set up because he wants every window to be the same level.
throughout my entire first floor. He's got his two guys there, and throughout the day, he's coaching them and making take pieces off. I saw him do it twice because it wasn't cut right. And I go, this is Larry's boy. He has my back. And that's a small kind interdependence. But to me, it's, it's, it kind of epitomizes what I believe the church is all about. Because we make a decision, we're dependent on sin, we say, I don't want to be that anymore. So we're independent. But the big step we do as family is we say, I'm going to trust you with my life. I'm talking about trusting my brother with my windows, and thank you. Because other people go to him, they can trust, and he can gather the boys, and that's what we do. But more than windows, it's watching one another's back as family. It's being there when we need each other, Right? It's being there for our children. It's being there when we need counsel, right? We can connect people with one another and say, you know what, I trust the counsel of one another. That's interdependence. And so that's going to be our goal over the next seven weeks. I hope you enjoy that because it's not enough to break away from sin and feel like you got it all together. But it's so much more fun when you were with a bunch of people that got it all together. Amen? So, Father, as we look at your word this morning, I pray, Holy Spirit, move in this place, Lord God. Speak to our hearts, Lord God. Teach us what it means to enjoy your freedom, Lord God, to be independent, and then to be interdependent, to be your body. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so it's the 4th of July. And I promised Shasti and all my other teachers that we'd, we'd do a little social studies today. So, you know, our, go to the next slide. And our country is just an incredible blend. I found a, 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 a group of kids that represent my grandchildren, right? So I got an Asian, I got a black, I got a white, I got some people that are all mixed in. And I thought, those are my two grandkids. But God bless America, right? That everybody can come and we can make beautiful children. And they're free. And they can do anything they want. Isn't that great? That's what I love about our country, one nation under God, right? And so the whole thing about it, next slide, is that the big thing is on July 4th, this document called the Declaration of Independence was ratified, right? Actually, it was voted on on July 2nd. John Adams was recording history and saying, July 2nd will be the greatest day in the history of America. There'll be parades and all kinds of stuff and all things going on. And people went back to him later and he said, well, John, you missed it by two. Because the 4th was the actual date on the document. It went through several revisions, right? So this day is celebrated. And actually, I'm really excited because my birthday is July 8th. And do you know on July 8th, 1776, that was the first official celebration of the 4th of July. It was on July 8th, of course. Thank you very much, Wayne. It was in Philadelphia where they sounded the cannons, rang the bells, and did everything. So next Saturday, when you're thinking about it, pray for Pastor John and say, God bless America, right? So anyway, but here's your social studies. So what's going on? 241 years ago, why did we leave our cozy nest with the British? Well, according to Schoolhouse Rock. Let's go here. I didn't want to show you the whole thing. So I, you guys don't remember Schoolhouse Rock, but they're awesome. Google them on YouTube. What caused the Revolutionary War? It says we were strongly independent. Now think about it. We were in, we were in Europe. They were looking for people there was, um, that wanted to go on an adventure across the Pacific Atlantic, Atlantic to this new nation, and they were looking for volunteers to colonize the British territory. So who do you think is going to go 3,000 miles and say, you want a piece of the land and do this? Only the people that are kolohe, right? All the nuts, all the people that are independent, but also people that were wanting to make their own decisions. Not including a whole bunch of people that said, we want to be free to worship in a different way, which was the bedrock of America. So these independent people, they wanted to do things. Great Britain was a long way away, and the people didn't want folks in another continent telling them what to do. So the British government, they decided to start taxing us because they had, they had um, taken over what was then America. Um, they had beaten the French and the Indians, and they had racked up debt. So they decided to say, well, all the people living there, they're going to pay for this. So they started taxing the you-know-what out of us, and we started going, wait a minute, this is not cool. 
that phrase, taxation without representation. Ticked off everybody enough that in a harbor in 1773, they had a tea party. What city was that in? Boston, the Boston Tea Party. So the folks got really ticked, right? And so things started happening. Guys start, before the Second Amendment was written, they said, I'm going to start bearing arms. And they start collecting arms and storing munitions, and there start little skirmishing thing, things going on. Then in the spring of 1775, a guy got on a horse. Remember? And he took a ride. What was his name? Paul Revere. One if by? Two if by? Three if by? No, just two. <laughs> but, you know, you got it. You got the whole thing, right? So he ran around, and then we had two little battles at Concord and Lexington, and that started the war. The summer of July, um, July of 1775, tall guy, wooden teeth, white hair, became Big George, became the leader, George Washington, of our Continental Army, right? And as things got going, this began the formation. As the colonies got together, which was really radical when you think about it, 13 separate places that had their own interests. And by the grace of God, by the grace of God, created the foundations of a nation that wrote these incredible words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, which among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's the bedrock of our country that people got together, together and said, God made people to be free. So 241 years later, we're in a country where we got stuffs. We got things. But no place else on this planet, and you ask people that are from other countries, do we have a country where you can be ticked off about your stuffs? And you have a right to be ticked off about your stuffs. And you have a right to be, to be upset with people. And you have a voice. And you can make decisions. And you're protected in your little place of stuffs. Isn't that wild? No other country on earth is like this. I thank God for it. I thank God that out of all the places in the world, he said, you know what, John? You can be an American. I thank God for that, that I get to pastor and present his word in a place of freedom. Isn't that great? But this freedom is so much more than, you know, so this is what our country's about. But the God who I believe got behind the stirring of our nation, he said this about you and I, 2 Timothy 1.7. For the spirit of God that God gave us does not make us timid. And that word is scared, fearful. It says, but it gives us power. It gives us love and gives us self-discipline. All right. So we're going to look at this. Here's the book. Go ahead, Jake, put that up. Here's the book that I'm going to be using throughout all of this. It's a good book, but a, whenever you read something, there's something that has to be underneath anything you read, right? You take whatever you read, you filter it through the Word of God. Whatever comes out, that's the truth that you hold on to. That's how I read everything. Whatever I read, I take it through the Word of God, and that's why I'm not scared to read anything. There's a lot of good stuff out there, but if it matches the truth, I'm going to walk with it, right? So that's why I can tell you, this book is awesome. And we're going to learn something that is really incredible about going from dependence to independence to interdependence, right? But check this out. Look in your notes because I want you to read. Our first freedom that we're going to talk about is being proactive. What does that mean? To be proactive, leave that, leave that up there, Jacob. To be proactive is about taking responsibility. Listen to this. Responsibility for your life. You can't keep blaming everything on your parents or grandparents. Proactive people recognize that they are response-able. Sound familiar, Scott? Scott and I have shirts that say that, response-able. You don't blame genetics, circumstances, conditions, or conditioning for their behavior. 
environment, right? Things. They know that they choose their behavior. Reactive people, check this out, not proactive. Reactive people, on the other hand, are often affected by their physical environment. They find external sources to blame for their behavior. It's always someone else's fault. Exactly, exactly, Wayne. If the weather is good, they feel good. If it isn't, it affects their attitude and performance, and they blame the weather. All of these external forces act as stimuli as we respond. Check this out. Next slide, Jacob. Between the stimulus and the response is your greatest power, and here's your gift from God. You have the freedom to choose what you're going to do. That's what God has given you. Go to the, um, the diagram slide that says um, the picture, reaction. So, something happens, we respond, right? Something happens, we respond. Versus, that's the wrong way to do it, by the way. The right way is something happens, you take a breath and go, I have choices right now. You could do that response thing, or you could consider what is the right thing to do. And can I just tell you, 1 John 3.20, just because you feel it doesn't make it right. Because God is greater than your heart. Let me tell you an example with my confession to my wife this morning over chicken and ginger. Thank you, Wayne. Chicken and ginger. Wayne's my sidekick right here. He reminds me. My son, Jordan, is texting my, my wife. He's coming home from the Middle East tomorrow. Third tour, he's coming home. I'm so happy. But um, they're talking, and I'm waking up, and I'm really wanting my ginger chicken soup. And so she didn't make it. So, but all of a sudden, I'm trying to talk to her, but she's busy talking to my son because he wants his seat, and she's taking care of him. And I had a little envy going on here, all right? So... I decided to ignore this part of the message and I responded while she was texting. I said, you know what? Are you finished taking care of your son? And I said it even worse than that. And ladies, you know the face we do when we want to make our all that kind? I full on facialed it out. And so, so my wife is... Doing this because, and ladies, you know this when us guys are like that. It's rare because we're usually perfect. And, um, you know, your son, I see her, she's doing her things. And Brenda texts with one finger. She's like, she goes. And I thought, oh, crap. You know, because instantly all the fear goes out the room when your wife stares at you like that. And so, um, and I had, I had a moment of truth there. I said, you know, honey, I'm really sorry. But my wife was really cool about it. She got up right away to go make my soup. Because she's a sweetheart. Tough little sweetheart, but she's tough. And I said, wait, wait. I said, you know what? I said, I got I to gotta confess this to you. Because I don't have room for a bitter root. Because the message that I'm giving to our church is too important for me to have issues with you. Because I don't want you leaving this room thinking that I'm not happy about my son coming home and about the fact that you're a great mom and the fact you're doing this. I said, I'm just feeling really sick and I really want chicken and ginger <laughs> soup. And I'm picking the wrong way to say it. Would you forgive me? <coughs> and she was a sweetheart. And she did. And, um, and she went and she, she finished her message with Jordan. She went and made me my soup and brought it here, right? And I'm not making all tantana like she's great and I'm not, or I'm great and all your husbands aren't. I'm not saying that, okay? But I want you to catch this. There are a million chicken and ginger soup moments. Million, scratch that. There are a lot of them every day that we go through with the people that are dear to us. And it's the people that are dear to us that most of the time don't get this the privilege of the Christian behavior. The people that are dear to us because they've been in our lives so long, we usually live like this. Something happens, we respond. Something happens, we respond. And we respond two ways. Either if you're like me, blah, 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 blah. 
Brenda, she'll keep quiet. But she'll let it go in here, and it'll come out later on. Because she ain't perfect either. She's a lot like Jim. We were talking about this. Jim and Brenda, they tend to kind of think about things. They'll let you know later on. Alicia and I, we'll let you know right away. Both of us, that's not the way to do it. I'm just telling you this, and I want you to laugh because, dear ones, we have freedom in Christ to be this people all the time. And I want to tell you, I am this person. This morning, when I made a horse's rear end about chicken and ginger soup, I had a moment right away to say, you know what? I just did this, but I can choose to go right back here because I'm free in Christ. I don't have to pay a penalty. I don't have to do all kind. I can come with sincerity and say, baby, you know what? That was wrong. My wife and I have this thing because we're both sick this week. And I'm sure you're like this. When, when we're sick, we take each other serious for nothing. I don't make any decisions. I, I didn't even study my message till yesterday because yesterday was the first day that I, I knew that I was on the planet Earth. And so it's like I just waited to study until yesterday because I'm not going to study a message when my brain's not working because you don't need that. An appointment with some, just one of our folks would get together and I canceled with her. I said, baby, you know what? I'm not going to be able to think because she needs more than someone who's just trying to be religious without having their brain in there. You hear what I'm saying? Didn't go out to dinner with friends, but we will go out next week. Didn't golf with my friends, but we'll do that next week. Didn't go to mini church. We'll do that next week. I really want you to catch this because in its simplicity, it's the key to the whole thing that we do. Will you take responsibility for your life? Will you stop blaming someone else for the things that are going on in your life? <coughs> and some of you have had hard things done to you by others. And none of what they did to you was right. But don't be their victims anymore. This is what I do. Three simple things. It's not on the notes. Freebie. You were wrong. What you did to me was bad. And you deserve this. But I release you from every penalty that you deserve. And regardless of what they do, regardless of what they say, you will not control my response any longer because I'm set free in Christ and I deserve to have a great life. Amen? Amen. That is a, seal that with applause. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I am free. I am free, right? So let's talk about this. Look at this. Think this picture. Now, Jacob, put up that scripture. We've got 10 minutes. We'll finish this up. For the spirit God gave us does not make us fearful. That's the key thing. We're no longer slaves to fear. When you're afraid, something happens. Ah, got to respond. Got to respond. That's that first picture. Fear is not a bad thing. Mama bears, you guys are good with this. That sense, that antenna, that third eye in the back of your head when you know that something's happening in the kitchen. Dad's busy with the remote going, they're fine, they're fine. And you just go there and you know because that little thing in you, that mama bear thing, you go and sure enough, they're where they shouldn't be and you know what to do, right? I'm not talking, ladies, about that part. You hold on to that. Your weakness, ladies, is because you're so good at being a mama bear that any time that fear button goes off, you think it's truth. And what you got to do sometimes is you got to just take a pause and say, is this a mama bear thing or is this a fear thing? Always be the mama bear, but don't act on fear. Guys. We always just, you know, we, when we have fear, we got, we're going to fix, we're going to charge it, we're going to do something, right? We're going to break it. We're going to do something about that, right? Fear means, wah, right? That's wah, just wah, right? And that's, I, I don't even know what the word is, but our action is wah. That's what we do, right? And, we, and then after that, we just go, whatever. You fix it, mama bear, <laughs> you know? No. Fear does things. Let's look at what are the fear. God's freed you from this. You don't have to be afraid anymore. Look at this. Romans 8 says this. 
The spirit you receive does not... Go back to the other one. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Here's the picture, the Roman picture. Literally, the word they use for slave is that when, they would, when people would be enslavers, they would be bent over and they would be changed ankles and wrists together. They would be bent over. So a slave would exist like this. To be set free, literally in the Greek, is to be unchained and put upright. So in the Greek, they know that when you're set free, it means, wow, I'm upright now. I'm upright. That's why to sin means you're bending over with nothing holding you down. How dumb is that? Something happens, you go, ah! Oh. People in public say, what are you doing? You go, well, I'm afraid. What are you doing? You want me to kick you in the rear end? No, when you're, when you're afraid, you never have to bend over because nothing is holding you down. Doesn't that make sense? That's the wonderful thing. So when you feel that reflex, go, ha, ah, psych. And don't beat yourself on the head. We've spent our life dependent in that position. God has come in and said, let me teach you a new position. Stand up. Wave your hands. Massage your back. Stand upright. You've been set free. And here's the good thing. Every time you mess up, God doesn't say, bend over and put that chain on. No. The Spirit has set you free, and you're free indeed. Isn't that great news? So you're not afraid of being made a slave again because you're, the Bible says the Spirit you receive, check it out. You're adopted as a son and daughter. By Him we cry, Daddy. Next slide. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we're God's children. That's why you feel so awesome when you worship the Lord. Didn't you feel great worshiping the Lord today? You just feel as, wow, yours is the kingdom, yours is the power. What a beautiful name it is. Wow, 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 wow. Jesus' love for my soul. Yeah, 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 right? Now, if we are children, then we're heirs, and, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And we always talk about this. We're going to share in his sufferings in order that we, we share in his glory. Just because you got to go through the middle doesn't mean God doesn't like you. I laid hand on myself all week, and I didn't get better doesn't mean God doesn't like me. It just means my body's 55, going on 56. It's going to take a little longer to shake a cold. Would have been better if I had ginger. No, just kidding. We won't go there. I don't know if you ever felt that you pray about something that doesn't work, and you go, wow, what's wrong, God? God's saying nothing. Romans 8, you live in a world that groans. That's what happens. Don't think too hard about it. Stuff happens. I got a flat tire. It doesn't mean I have sin in my life. It means one of you, you know, you better sweep in front of your house because I got a little thing. <laughs> I don't get big caught up in stuff happens. Things break. Fix it. It's not some sign from God. Fix it. Sorry, I'm just practical that way. No fear, what? You're not longer tied to the past. Second Corinthians 5 says this. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. You are brand new. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who's reconciled him to himself through Christ and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. I told you this before that, you know, I've done some stupid things in my life. And I remember um, a couple years ago, somebody came up to me and they wanted to talk to me about one of the stupid things I had done. And they go, wow, eight years ago you did this. And they go, that was dumb. I said, yeah, dumbest thing I ever did in my life. And they go, wow, you don't seem to feel bad about it. I said, I said, I feel really bad about it. Go, You're not acting like it. And I said, that was seven years ago. I don't live there. As a matter of fact, can I just be bold? What I did back then doesn't define who I am. That was stupid. I'm a forgiven child of God that is moving forward. I don't live there. I'm going this way. Well, I don't know. I just feel really, you know what? I am not going to have an emotion so that you can feel good about me feeling good. You want me to feel bad. Hey, if you did stupid stuff, call it stupid, but don't live there. Yeah. The past is not a hitching post. When somebody brings it up, you go, whoa, that's right. No, you look back and go, that was idiotic. I'm not going to do that again, but I'm looking forward. Why? Because I got Brenda, I got my kids, I got two grandkids, and I, we got <laughs> great stuff we're going to be doing at this church. You don't have time with a pastor always doing this, you know? The old is gone. Don't fear the past. Deal with the past. No longer fear punishment. 1 John 4.18 says this. You don't have to fear this, right? 
There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. I'm going to put this in context. When you sin, God doesn't take your name off your permanent room in heaven. Shirk, that's it. Three times, you know what? You had a suite. You are back here. You never have to fear that. You may have repercussions because of your mistake. Don't mistake. When you make a mistake, you have to pay the price here. You have to make up in relationships. You may lose a job. You may have to pay off that credit card. But your place in heaven is secure. And that's what he's talking about. You never have to fear eternally what goes on when you're an idiot for a moment. Okay? And that's important. Because the security of God, he doesn't sit there and dangle that you're an heir of God, then you're not. You're an heir of God, then you're not. You're in heaven, then you're not. No, you're in heaven. Okay? No more fear. Right? Fourth thing. You no longer have to be poisoned by the bitter root of unforgiveness, right? Hebrews says this. See to that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. You know what, John? Where is it? Life is more than ginger chicken soup. Don't make this be the issue of your life. Whether you react or you stew and react later, don't make it the issue of your life. I'm using something Monini. If someone's hurt you, don't let their action be the issue of your life. It's important. Why? Because there's too many great things to do ahead of you, right? Don't let a bitter root grow. Don't let the sucker even get moisture. Find it, pull it out, throw it away, right? Next thing here. We're going to skip that one. Strongholds we'll talk about in a couple weeks anyway. Now, go back to the scripture, um, 2 Timothy. For the Spirit of God, okay, we talked about we don't have to be fearful. Why? It gives us power. What kind of power? The best power. You are most strong when you are weak. Check this, what it says in Corinthians. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. That's God speaking. He says, my power is made perfect in your weakness. God loves when you say, there's no way I can do that. And God goes, finally. Finally. You figured it out. You ever been in a conversation where somebody's said something or they've done something, you've been in a situation and you bit your tongue and you walk in way and go, I can't believe I just did that. I had like five things I wanted to say. I didn't say any of it. The devil goes, you wuss. The Lord goes, well done. Well done. I don't know how I did that. And God says, that's where you tasted my power. We just celebrated our 32nd anniversary. I celebrate it every year because of, you know, the story of our marriage and everything else. And people love our marriage. And all they say about it is, I can't believe all that you've been through that you guys are together and we're together by the grace of God. It's something that we couldn't figure out, but God did. In our weakness, he is strong. And that's why we're strong. Don't be afraid of weakness. It exposes what you need because when you're weak, then you see the power of God. Amen? Right? So that's the strength God's talking about. Right? Look at the scripture again. 2 Timothy says this. For the spirit of God, we're not afraid. We have power and weakness and we have his love. What kind of love? Romans 5 says this. This is the kind of love that when you're going through tough stuff, when you're sick and laying hands on yourself and you're not getting better, God still loves you, right? Hope doesn't just put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he's been given to us. The situation doesn't define how much God loves you. Stuff happens in this world. Some of it really, it's just, it's terrible and it's hard. But don't let people or circumstances change your view of God's love. Get on your face and say, Lord, I'm not feeling your love. He will manifest his love for you. 
He will do that. That is on him. He will show you how much he loves you. But don't let stuff question his love for you. Right. Lastly, 2 Timothy says this. Spirit of God says we don't have to be afraid. His power showed in our weakness. His love when it doesn't look lovable. And self-discipline. Love this in Proverbs. Check this out. Counsel and sound judgment. They're mine. I have insight. I have power. In the Hebrew, this is someone that says, I have a firm grasp on this. You know when something's yours and you go, that's mine. That's what it means right here in the Hebrew. You know, counsel and sound judgment, they are mine. That's the freedom that God's given you. You can think right. You can do right. You can do the right thing. And when you do the wrong thing, you can come back and do the right thing. Right? That's the power of being proactive. So how do we wrap this up? It's what we always wrap it up with. John 8, 32 says this. If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Then you'll know the truth. And the truth will set you free. And if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. Come on up, Tim. God, there's such a blessing that you have for us as we begin to know you, Lord God. And Lord, on the eve of the 241st birthday of the United States of America, God, thank you out of all the places in the world, Lord, that you allowed us to be citizens of this country, Lord God. And God, we invite you, you, Jesus, you, Jesus, Lord of our life, we invite you now to the very heart of who we are, Lord God. And God, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, help us as a church as we break the bonds of sin in Jesus' name, Lord God. And so, God, I receive your gift of freedom this morning. I am responsible. I am 100% responsible for my life. And Lord, thank you that you set me free. I'm not bent over like a slave anymore. Nothing's holding me down to be dependent. God, I choose to stand upright. I choose to call on your power. I will not be afraid, Lord God. Bless our mama bears, Lord. When they know, they intuitively know, Lord God. Hold on to that strength, Lord God. But bless our mama bears, Lord, when they need to let go of that. And that alarm is not your truth. Bless us, Papa Bears, Lord God. When we're just busting in and fixing things and doing stuff, Lord God, that we take a breath. And all my baby bears are here today, Lord God. I pray in Jesus' name, Lord God. We're new creations. We're touched by you. We're forgiven by you, Lord God. We're loved by you. We don't have to be afraid. I have power and weakness, Lord God, because that's you. I have a love that goes beyond what I can imagine, Father, any circumstance. And all this stuff, Lord, your word says, it's mine. So I lay hold of that right now. In Jesus' name, Lord God, bless this family, Lord Jesus. Bless them, Lord God. Go ahead and enjoy, Tim. Worship team, come on up. Just enjoy your moment right now.